Alright, so that mic should be on. Uh, welcome, this is the first of six videos for our close study of text for Module B. Um, close study of text. And we are studying Wilfred Owen and his war poems. As you can see by the title, this one's about Dolce et Decorum est per patri mori. First thing I'll do is read the whole poem out loud for your benefit. <coughs> Bent double like old beggars under sacks. Knock kneed, coughing like hags. We cursed through sludge till on the haunting flares we turned our backs and towards our distant rest began to trudge. Men marched asleep. Many had lost their boots, but limped on, bloodshod. All went lame, all blind, drunk with fatigue, death, death even to the hoots of tired, outstripped five nines that dropped behind. Gas, gas! Quick, boys, an ecstasy of fumbling, being the clumsy helmets just in time. But someone was still yelling out, and stumbling, and floundering like a man in fire or lime. Dim through the misty panes and thick green light, as under a green sea, I saw him drowning. In all my dreams, before my helpless sight, he plunges at me, guttering, choking, drowning. If in some smothering dreams you too could pace behind the wagon that we flung him in, and watch the wide eyes writhing in his face, his hanging face like a devil sick of sin. If you could hear at every jolt the blood come gargling from the froth corrupted lungs, obscene as cancer, bitter as the cud, a vile and curable sores on innocent tongues. My friend, you would not tell with such high jest, to children are dent for some desperate glory, the old lie, dolce et decorum est. Propari Mori. So that's the poem as it is. One of the first things we need to look at is what that title and what those last sort of section actually means. And here it is. It's a sarcastic or ironic title which is actually the opposite of the poem's content. The translation is, it is sweet and decorous to die for one's country. So it's a good thing, dying for one's country. But that's the exact opposite of the picture that Owen has painted here for us. Now I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of the poem, and then we're going to get into specific analysis of techniques. So the poem from the first stanza describes soldiers on the battlefield, obviously not going, yeah, this battle's awesome. It's a negative depiction of the soldiers. He uses sludge, they're drunk with fatigue, he uses that metaphor to describe them. There's similes in there also to describe them. Um, you know, conditions aren't great. They're trudging through sludge. If we think back to those videos we've watched about the conditions of the first war, we can have that image in our mind. And he does really well to create an excellent image for us. A gas attack occurs, and one man fails to get his mask on in time. Fast forward. You know, we don't know how long we're fast forwarding here. Weeks, months, even possibly years. And the persona speaking is still affected by the incident and comments about other people's attitudes towards the war. The things are pretty clear. War has no glory. Horror of war. The dehumanization that happens in war. And war having lasting effects on the individuals. Now, as we go through, through our, um, my annotations right now, something I want you to think about is the mood and the tone of the poem. All right? I haven't made direct comment of that, but that's something we will discuss in class. And we will, and it will turn up in our questions, and it will be something you'll be expected to comment on in your essays. So we look at that. All right. So the highlight stuff is the uh, technique that we're going to talk about. There's only two for this slide. There is more in this passage. Uh, just with my formatting skills, I couldn't fit them all on. So the first one is a simile. Uh, it compares the soldiers to beggars because of both their appearance and the connotations of being uncared for. Yes, for is spelt wrong there. I apologize, okay. The next one is coughing like hags. Alright. Hag is a dishe disheveled elderly woman. So, you got that comparison, their physical state, and the negative connotation. So, you call someone a hag, you're thinking witches, you're thinking elderly, you're thinking uncared for. 
Uh, so we, we're all taking these notes, we're all writing stuff down as I speak, and what is actually written there, guys. So as you can see, there's quite a few more here. So haunting flares. Uh, flares signal the end of the day of fighting. Um, ended the fighting for the day, sorry. They're described as haunting as they appear ghostly in the darkness. It can also be described as uh, haunting because the, the war itself haunts these soldiers. It's not like they go to war and then they forget about it. Next thing we're going to look at is the use of the personal pronouns. So, in this case he's using we. Later on he uses I and I saw different things. But what that does is it allows us to view the poet as a soldier. We know that he was there. All right? And the poem itself becomes more believable. It adds uh, an element of realism to it. You know, we, we believe him. He's much more believable as a, a narrator by saying we. Okay, if he said the soldiers, we'd be like, oh yeah, good on ya. Next thing is the repetition. So, uh, but limped on bloodshot, all went lame, all blind. So every soldier here is uh, suffering. Uh, bloodshot refers to their feet. Right, so their feet have been so torn up by the marching and the constant nature of the battles that they're described as bloodshot. It's normally a common term used to describe the feet of horses, uh, which we can discuss is, again, a dehumanizing factor. You get the alliteration adding to the oral, oral sorry, nature of the poem. Okay, so it sounds good that he's used it. We've got this metaphor of drunk with fatigue. All right, they're not actually blind drunk. They're drunk on fatigue. They've been moving across the battlefield. They're moving as if they've been drinking. Of course, we know they haven't. They've just been fighting. All right, so that's stanza one. Moving on to stanza two. Opens with this gas, gas, quick boys. Which is a series of short sentences show how something has changed for the soldiers. You can also talk about the capitalization of that first gas and the exclamation marks there. Okay. There's something that you guys can comment on. I'm not going to give you that. I feel confident that you can. Oh, yeah. An ecstasy of fumbling, fitting the clumsy helmets just in time. So, an ecstasy of fumbling. Interesting turn of phrase to describe the panic and the rush of putting in, putting on the gas helmets, or the gas masks, sorry. And they've got them on just in time. But that relief is only brief because we have this conjunction but there. And we, then we read on, we find out that someone hasn't got theirs on. And he describes, he uses a simile to describe how he's moving. And he uses stuff that we as a reader might be familiar with. So we might be able to put an image to that of what he, this man looked like as he was suffering the effects of the gas attack. He uses a, um, another simile here to describe the, the effect of the gas attack on the, the landscape. So it's like being underwater, it's like being in green sea, and that's just to, to describe what it actually looks like. We've then got this two-line stanza. So, in all my dreams, that line shows that he has been affected by this for a long time, and he plunges at me. Again, you can see the use of the personal pronoun, we've already commented on that, if you want to mark them with a different colour or something just so you know for your analysis later and your revision later you can also come in on guttering, choking, drowning All right, that is a listing and it describes the effect which again creates an image in our mind now flung um, so he's here he's saying he opens up by going well if you ever see this in your dream it's going to be awful for you firstly because we flung him flung is not a nice way to treat a dead body, even a, you know, a friend of yours, an old friend. So he uses a simile to describe the horror, uh, describe the whole soldier's face, which shows the horrors of war. All right, he's hanging face like a devil's sick of sin. Right, that's an awful description. We've also got the capitalization of the word lie to show that it's important. All right, we've also got, we've got some imagery in there as well, we've got some other similes in there, um, you know, obscene as cancer, 
bitter as the cud. Um, come gurgling from throth corrupted lungs. It's quite um, sensually appealing to the senses. We can hear, we can picture these lungs and we can picture the sounds that they've been making. Now, what we can also look at here in this final part is the use of different types of words. So in blue you've got smothering, hanging, corrupted, bitter and vile. Then in the red we've got high zest, ardent and glory. So what you should be seeing is the type of words that he's used, the word choice, is very different. We've got a group of negative words with negative connotations, then we've got these positive words that help him really hammer home that point that the lie of dying for your country is not something to strive for. So what I've written here as the actual annotation is uh, words that have positive uh, negative connotations are in blue, red have the positive, and the contrast reveals the re reality of war on the front line compared to its perception on the home front. So, in reality, it's smothering, you know, hanging faces, corrupted, it's bitter, it's vile. But at home, there's people that are looking for this glory, that are you know, looking, and people are saying with you know, zest, which is positivity and happiness, that it's great to die for one's country, which is, again, the opposite of everything in the poem itself. So, Wilfred Owen is not saying that, he's saying the opposite of it, that's why it's used sarcastically and ironically. Hope this helped, we'll have a discussion of the poem in class, and I hope you all watch it.